Welcome to Series 2, Episode 3 of Out of Your League. I'm Gethin Jones, making my debut today alongside some of the game's greats and Mark Flanagan. Seriously though, um, I'm here as a replacement for your regular halfback, Will Perry, who unfortunately got stuck in a pair of his carrot-tapered skin-tight jeans on the way out of his house. He's now got an Uber to his mum's house to oil them off, but luckily the rest of the panel tonight have made it unscathed. Although John Wilkin always looks like he's been in a scrap or two. But that's okay, because he knows... He's my favourite. Ever since I told him, he was hung like a horse live on radio. Remember that, John? I do remember Still that. Still talked about very, it. Very, very inaccurate, but <laughs> apart from that, yes. No. Seahorse. Maybe, <laughs> <laughs> maybe you can explain that another time. But for now, we turn our attention to our special guest. Now, if we were recording this four years ago, he probably would have cycled all the way from Warrington on a BMX. But this is 2020. He's probably just driven here in his family size SUV. It's the Maori Cook Islander who, uh, when he's not playing centre stage, he likes to sell watches for Daryl Clock and put a few bets on for you guys. It's the multi betting, multi talented man of the people, Anthony Gelling. Man of the people. Man of, man the, of the people. people. Gone, Say man of the people. Self oh. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, it was. That <laughs> is officially a better nickname than John's, which is the horse. Yeah, should, uh, should, should we give that? That needs some clarity, doesn't it? Do you want to do that now? So in, in 2003, Gethin came to my house and um, he was simulating a day in the life of a rugby player um, for when he was working at Blue Peter, when it, you know the career, the career yeah, was the going better then, wasn't yeah, it? Well, the it was going better. Then, it was earning money. <laughs> yeah, so we came round to my house and we pretended to be having this massage. Um, and what he tried to say was when I got off the massage bed that I had a big frame. But he said, I was built like a horse. <laughs> as, a, as had a towel and around my waist. He didn't see that your front, he just saw the back. No, no. The he should have said built like a prawn. Yeah. <laughs> that would have been more effective. It, it, but the it, thing was then, it just it sort of just grew in stature, that story, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. what, not, what, not, grew? Not, what grew? <laughs> so, yeah. Is it the same story as it? Change as a Chinese <laughs> whisper. I don't remember no. that story. My no, that's, story yeah, that, that's different. absolutely how I remember it. Yeah, it's yeah. not quite as good as Man of the People, though, is it, Anthony Gelling? Eh? What there's about there's that? there's worse than nicknames out there. Uh, yeah. is it, but the thing is, it's because you swore a ref or something, isn't it? Is that how you got the title? Um, I said that uh, the video referee. I said the time he takes pisses me off. <laughs> and sure enough, whoa, whoa, whoa can't say that. I you can't say mate. that. Yeah. I tell it like it is. I'm the man of the people. <laughs> That's true, though. You're right. You well, are right. Right, these man of the people, or, or both? Yeah, no, the video ref is right. No, the video ref here. Yeah, you do <laughs> actually. You know, you are, I suppose, a little bit different to the norm in that you play a professional sport, yet you still very much have been yourself throughout mm. the whole thing. There's no kind of management of your media, is there? Which people nah, love. It's refreshing. Nah, yeah, I don't think so. Rugby league's a weird one. Like sometimes I look at rugby league and I think. How is this a professional sport sometimes, you know? Like it's, you look at like, if you compare it to like Premier League and NFL and all these things. And then last year I was playing championship and I'm thinking, well, if this is a professional sport, this must be like the last, <laughs> the last <laughs> rung of the ladder just holding on, <laughs> you know? It's, um, it's quite, it's very unique, very, uh, very niche, but I think that's what makes it what it is. Yeah. Um, out of respect. So, I, so in that, in, sense, yeah. in that sense, sorry, it's, it's, uh, it's easy to kind of, um, be yourself amongst it. I think there's a lot more freedom than and social media as well helps because you yeah you got a you got a uh, platform you know a voice there to you know I don't have to wait to do a podcast to say what yeah. I'm thinking you yeah. know what I mean yeah. no but please say what you're thinking today you know Will loves to put things in order doesn't he when he, he does yeah can I do the same so we should we go back a little yeah, bit cool. before we, we want to do forward? chronology we're going to um, do time also I think I've listened to every single one of these podcasts and this is series two episode three and I still yet yeah, haven't heard Mark Flanagan ask a question do you think that no, he's going to ask one I just keep in the background it, and it the takes, it takes him one line every now and again 40 minutes and he'll get warmed up if you want a question just give me the nod yeah I put my hand up that's what I used to do that'd be nice like in the school class. Um, yeah. Let's go back to, to Auckland, born in Auckland. Yep. Um, what was uh, life back then like as a kid? What kind of child were you? Um, I, was, I, was, I was quite naughty to start with. Um, I kind of bounced around a few schools and stuff. Um, I, was, I was quite an angry kid. Um, I think when I, mean, I first started school, I was, I was always getting into fights and I think I hit my teacher, I think in the first week. Um, that's strong, isn't it? As the first week, first goes, week, just yeah, punching your teachers quite yeah, strong. It wasn't, it wasn't a good start. I think first day actually, she sent me outside, and I just thought, well, why am I outside? Like, I just walked home. She came outside and she was like, "Where is he?" <laughs> I said, "Oh, he's, he's at home." She pulled up with the principal. I'm at home, sitting on the balcony, just eating Fruit Loops or whatever. And she went, "You can't just walk home." Like, well, why not? <laughs> I go, well, "That's what it is." Yeah. I was always kind of questioning. You know, so the next time she sent me outside, she said, don't go outside, outside, just 
sit in the little uh, the little bit where you keep all your bags and stuff, and I w- would have eaten about 14 lunches. <laughs> and they didn't believe me. They're like, where's all the food? I said, I ate it all. They're like, no, you didn't. Where is it? I said, it's gone. <laughs> like, what would you do with 13 sandwiches? You need to follow <laughs> orders as a child. Though. You don't know unless you're told, right? That's yeah, the thing. that's it. You don't, yeah, you don't know unless you, unless when, you ask. Eh? When did you know you were good at rugby, rugby league? Uh, when did you first pick up a ball? Um, I think I used to play football because my mum didn't didn't like the contact of, of rugby. Yeah, oh. yeah, soccer. So I played um, I played soccer up until I was about uh, eight years old. So this guy that I used to uh, kick around with, he he was like my best mate. I used to go to his house every day, and then he'd go to rugby training. And so eventually they just said, "Well, why don't you just play as well?" Mm. And um, yeah, his old man was like, uh, I think he was like an assistant coach or something, but um. Yeah, as the years went by, like he's someone I've I really looked up to, and um, yeah, he just he was a kind of one that said, you know, you can do this for a living if you want to. Yeah, was that was that a place to put? You sort of painted a picture of this uh, roguish young kid. Mm. Was rugby the ideal sort of place to put that personality into? If you know what I mean? Yeah, I think I think what appealed uh, what appealed um, to me the most was because uh, my mum and dad had split. Like the time that I'd spend with my dad. Like he was quite, he, well, he said it himself, he, he was quite immature at that age. Um, one way that we really connected was through rugby. Yeah. So um, I used to go to his house every other weekend. Uh, my nan, she's quite a devout Catholic woman. We used to uh, go to church um, every night, say the rosary, six o'clock. Um, I think it was one day, everyone's getting ready to go out to church and my dad just kind of pulled me to the side. And he was like, no, nah, no, nah, you're going to stay with me today. I'm going to watch the NRL grand final. I think it was... Uh, 1999 Melbourne versus St George, yeah. and like just to be pulled out of the church group, I was yeah. like, "Whoa, what's going on yeah, here?" Yeah. And then you know to kick it with my dad, just me and him, it was like really special. Yeah. yeah. And then you know as I started playing too, like he took a real interest, and that's how we always connected. Mm-hmm. So for me to to play rugby, you know, I feel like I'm make, making my dad proud, and you know, just kind of brings people together. Yeah, for sure. So my mum and dad don't really they didn't really talk at the time, but. They'd have to both come to the games and you know say hello, and so that was always. Uh, That's a really powerful point, yeah, though, isn't massive, it? Like yeah. from yeah. a split Jeez. family, and it was rugby that actually brought yeah, them just together kept, as a yeah, family. Yeah, kept everyone on the same page, and I, d- I didn't realise it at the time, but looking back, I think that's what what made me kind of fall in love with the game. Yeah, I, I read. Um, tell me if this is not true, but I, I saw something. I think where you said when you were eight, you picked up a ball and you ran round everyone. Is that right? And then. You dropped the ball over the try line. Yeah, yeah, I bombed my first try. Really? So you're like, this is good. I'm good at the um, getting past people. Yeah. But the finishing, the little maybe need some work. Yeah, what was it? I, um, I'd, I'd run run across the line and I'm going to go put the ball down. And um, and I dropped it. And my coach said, mate, we, oh, what did he say? He said, why you bend down and put the ball down like that? You look like a banana. Just <laughs> dive. <laughs> just dive on the ground and you can't go wrong. So Actually, you don't often dive. I was looking at some of your best tries before um, meeting you tonight. And uh, you do like a placement of the ball, don't you? You're not, yeah, it's, it's not a massive safe. dive. So right? it's like I slide. Depending on how much time I have, I kind of slide on one leg. And it's quite retro, that. Yeah. Yeah, if you watch back in, in the 80s, a lot of the guys were doing that. Yeah. So your your grounding technique is very much the 1980s school. So is that when you first started? Well, yeah. When yeah. you debuted. Well, well, yeah, you when I started did. playing rugby, Mark, you're quite yeah. right. It's a long time ago. It's because yeah. there's no water um, on the pitches back then. Either. It was probably just sand. No, you just that's stop. Yeah. Like the <laughs> I, did, I, did, I have watched a lot of a lot of um, rugby from the eighties as well. <laughs> yeah. Like a lot of old footage. I was just when I was growing up, I was just obsessed with the game. I just, just mad though, wasn't it? The hits. I mean, they're ridiculous now. But back then, it was literally no rules whatsoever. Were yeah. there? Yeah. But yeah. It, was thug- it was thuggery then, wasn't it? You know, it, it was more. It was more brutal, more violent, like for sure. But it's become more refined. Hasn't it? Yeah. Like even, it's, even it's more scientific now. You must understand that with yeah. going back to the NRL. Even even back. not that long ago, like I was watching a game. I think it was Brisbane versus Wigan, uh, maybe late nineties, early two yeah. thousands, and even that was completely different to what it is now. I think Wendell Saylor took a carry and they dropped them on his head. It's and fine. he got up and knocked it on. They went, whoa, knock on, knock on. Yeah, like, yeah, whoa, yeah. I I've just remember, been thrown on his neck. Yeah. I remember watching the Origin games when I was at uni, like, it was 2000, something like that. But they used to kick off and then kick the ball back just so they get the first hit in. It was that brutal, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, um, but have you ever dropped the ball over the line, you two? No, I don't get a chance much. In the act of scoring? Yeah, no. No, no, I've only scored a handful of good tries. <laughs> the majority of mine have been pathetic. 
You know, like someone's really <laughs> bad defend, like a defensive player that's really bad, and you end up scoring. But like, I never like I've never rounded any. He's talking no, about rounding the full oh, team. Yeah, yeah. When I was that's, a kid. yeah, but you still can do that now. Yeah. You still do that now. Is uh, I don't think that's anything I've I've ever done really. Fif uh, Fifty two tries was it for Wigan in one hundred and two games, something like that. Uh, Scored a few beaties back then, didn't he? Yeah. Good period, yeah. Wigan. Loved it. Yeah, it was a good period. But it was it was at a period where we were. We were smashing teams some mm. week, you know. It's like if you didn't score, like, whoa, what's wrong with this guy? Yeah, yeah. But, um, talk about about Wigan because you became a massive, um, like, a massive star on and off the pitch as well, wasn't mm. it? When there was a big story about didn't you sort of cycle to cycle to the game on a BMX and stuff? And that was it before he played Saints, actually. Was, was that it before Saints? That Good Friday. Game? It, it was a Good uh, Friday game. It was, yeah. There was one season I rode my bike every week because I I moved just behind the stadium, so there's a shortcut. Um, Cross the canal. There's a little bridge. Cross the canal, and there's no traffic. Ah, so quicker than actually getting in the car, yeah, so it's driving around. Yeah, yeah. Getting yeah. in the car is a hassle. I didn't want to do that. That's, that's so funny. That was picturing a good 30 mile bike ride nah, on a BMX nah, nah. through you know the Wigan winter to get there. No, nah, not at all. That's why I always pull up, no sweat. Just <laughs> is that 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 <laughs> this 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 realistic personality? What you've got is like connected to you know saying the man of the people. Mm. He's got this realistic element to your character. It's but it's like I'm not I'm not. I, is that always been you? Do you know what I mean? Have you always been a bit zany, off the wall, a bit different? Or is that something that has sort of blossomed as you've become uh, great at what you do? I've always I've always I've always hated being the same. Like I truly do believe that uh like variety is the spice of life, you know? Yeah. I hate I hate predictability, I hate knowing how things are gonna go. Um I've been like that since I was a kid. As I've gotten older I'm more comfortable about um Saying, saying what's on my mind, or you know, it's Will doing, Perry texting in already, doing doing, doing what I feel. So, um, yeah, is it, is it's, it's definitely turned up with the social media. Yeah, like social media makes it look like yeah, I'm this crazy guy, but I'm just a I'm just a normal. Person. Is that cha is it is it changed slightly as you've got older, and obviously now with the young family as well, mm. or is your mindset still very much the same in terms of wanting to be a bit different and um, uh, speaking your mind? No, I still I still want to be a bit different. But uh, my thoughts are a bit more organised, you know, a bit less impulsive. Um, my party trick used to be uh, at school, I'd jump off like the highest thing onto like flat ground. Like that was, I had like perfect technique for like tucking and rolling and stuff. So that was always my thing was I'd jump off anything. Well, like onto concrete? Onto concrete, onto grass, onto anything. But <laughs> as I got older, it became like jumping off into water. So. Um, no fear. Uh, I got banned from Jukes 92 for jumping in the canal off the roof. <laughs> um, I think you've been um, banned from there. Actually. Yeah, that was for something completely different. I didn't know you could jump off. Wait, so you jump into the canal from there? or? Yeah, yeah. So it was it was Lee Breers that spotted it. <laughs> Lee Breers. And he's Welsh said, legend. I said to you, oh, I can't remember how we got talking, but he ended up saying, oh, I'll, I'll give you 200 quid, you jump off there. And I was like, piece he's of cake man <laughs> does he know who he's talking to he doesn't know my drop and roll technique <laughs> yeah oh well i tried to get upstairs and they said oh sorry there's a private function upstairs i went oh no worries i won't be here for long but there's a sign <laughs> saying sophie's birthday upstairs so i walked back around he goes what are you doing i said oh i'm just here to see sophie oh yeah sophie and the girls are all upstairs i went yeah sweet walked up and their table's kind of blocking the balcony so I've walked up to the table and they're going oh like who's this and i've just kind of gone oh excuse me excuse me jumped up on the table over the railing they're like, what are you doing? <laughs> Took my shirt off. <laughs> <laughs> it's a stripper. Yeah, and then, yeah, jumped in. When was this? Two, when was this? Um, uh, how many years ago? 2017, maybe. Yeah. 200 quid, not bad. Yeah, not back bad, in 2017. Eh? Yeah. Mark won't even go skiing for the weekend because he's scared of his boss having to go at him. But, you know. That's it, yeah. I'm a you're like polar opposite, opposite compared to this you? fella. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I feel safe doing that stuff. It's... Um, you feel safe, that's, that's you, isn't it? Yeah, that's well, we, we always grew up doing it because I lived by the beach growing up, so jumping down on the rocks and stuff, mm. like low tide. What's, what's your record, Anthony? What's, highest what's the highest thing? you've been? Uh, the highest one was on a, it was on a school kayaking trip. Um, we went up, we stopped for lunch, and we walked up to the top of this mountain, um, and I was jumping off, kind of being a show-off, you know. I jumped off once, twice. A few of the other kids kind of joined in, and then uh, the teacher said to me, I bet you're not brave enough to do it backwards. I mean, oh, I bet I am. And he 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 like stood in front of me and kind of like went to half push me, and I just jumped. And I'm falling like this. I'm wearing a life jacket and a helmet, and I've hit the water like, <laughs> and like momentarily I can't move anything. 
and I like, oh, no. I'm just winded, so there's no ear going in. I can't move my arms, and I thought I'm dead here. <laughs> and dead. so I can like slowly start doggy pedaling. He's um, he's pulled my life jacket. Um, turns out I cracked the C7 little vertebra in my neck. Oh, my God. We're, <laughs> we're two days up river. We got another day to go, and it's white rappers like. <laughs> <laughs> but there's nowhere to go with a broken neck with a broken neck and there's nowhere to go so that was that was probably one of the toughest things i've ever got through that oh getting God. to the end of that trip how old were you then uh 15 i think it's a fair effort that. yeah so we we got to the campsite in that afternoon and we still had another day to go and um someone said oh here's some nurofen for your neck <laughs> solid so yeah. i went solid took about six of them and then I feel like I was holes burning in my stomach. Like you're not meant to take them on an yeah, empty not stomach. Too many either. Yeah. So now I've got this, and I've got this. <laughs> oh wow! Get back in the boat. I'll tell you what, Wayne would have loved that, wouldn't he? Oh, no, broken no. neck, walking up a big mountain. I love that. I love that meme. I love that. Do they, do, do, you know, like, do, do managers, head coaches, know that about you before they sign you? You know that you. This is information that people should know before you <laughs> sign yeah, a player. Yeah, yeah. I, I reckon it's weird. Like recruitment-wise in rugby league, they don't really do much digging. You know, they watch a couple of clips and go, yeah, you can do this and that. Mm. But a lot of times, well, from what I see anyway, a lot of times you don't really know much about a person. And it's so hard when you've got a bunch of kids and you're trying to pick which kid's going to kick on and do well. The kids don't even know themselves, really. Yeah. You know, if you sit down and ask them stuff, they're going, oh, I don't know. Yeah. You know, what kind of person are you? Oh, I don't know. What do you want to do when you're older? I don't know. Yeah. What do you like about the game? I don't know. Yeah, that, that's yeah. really interesting now because like sometimes selection even or into mm. squads especially internationally it's about culture isn't it as much as yeah you culture play, yeah? It's chemistry but, but when you when you're an older player i think you understand culture like like anthony's saying now mm. i think he understands culture it's something that comes to you with time that is yeah. not something when you're a young guy coming through you i don't think you're ever aware of culture or this that you're part of something bigger than you know, yeah. just playing your professional sports career. Well, so how, cult- how effective it is as well. Yeah, yeah, but culture is like a weird thing. Is what what I'm actually really confused by the what it means. You know, the culture of an organisation. What 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 does that mean? Well, it's just behaviours. It's how you behave. It's mm. the attitude of people who are around. And when you're young, you have no you have no apprehend that you have no understanding of that. Like you you, you mm. walk into a changing room, and the greatest thing you can do at the start of a career is just be there. Like, yeah, I, don't think, I don't think your job is to contribute an awful it's, lot. It's the unwritten rules of the, the senior players, isn't it? The people that set those guidelines and those standards. And I reckon probably mm. Wigan was looking, knowing a little bit of it and looking from the outside, it's probably, that's one of the strongest cultures when you, during your period would be. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, you, you knew what, what the culture was. It had an identity, like you say, from the outside looking in. You don't have to be there to see nah. to see how it is. But what makes it more complex is there's no correct culture. No, no, no. Like if it works and you're winning, is that the correct well, culture? Was that? You were you were in a mm. culture of play hard, drink hard, and yeah, you won yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. But well, we were that, but that, that was, was, that was just, for the just, era though. That's, that's, that's what that I'm talking about. Just Wigan, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. As well. you, to, you, a, to, to an extent. Now, we, but Wigan, it would have been different because it's different people. Yeah. You know, you can't put the same set of rules on a different set of people. And each each group defines their own rules. Like exactly. the, the the team that I played, the the successful St. Helens teams that I played in, it was kind of weird because we had this. Um, it was like a, a self sabotage dynamic, which was weird. It was like we were that good. At times, we would sabotage ourselves, like through behaviour, through getting on the drink too much, through overly celebrating things that didn't need to be celebrated we had this this many clashing personalities what did you over celebrate Give everything, people dropping everything. The ball. yeah you know everyone else Woo! yeah well we had, we again. had right if you think about this team and it's dysfunctional it's dysfunctional and and i think a blend of people's right and and, and when i watched wigan and just just making a point about you is when i looked at wigan it was all structured and organized yet we had this guy who played left center for him who was didn't conform to anything yourself who just making his own rules up doing his own thing charging down dropouts which is one of my favorite Brilliant things man. or charging down you know the penalty. conversion yeah, attempt yeah. sorry yeah. yeah um you know all of these things but th- it requires a blend of people but mm. at st helens we, i think we had uh paul wellens paul schoolthorpe sean long kieran cunningham you know big big names 
and they were all sort of tussling for the, yeah. and, you know, who's you, senior. You guys, were, who's, you guys were so good for so long. And I think a lot of teams, they go, oh, well, <laughs> it's kind of like the culture of rugby league. You know, people say, oh, well, you can't just get on the piss all the time. Oh, well, St. Helens done it. Look how good they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's true, yeah. So, and it's hard to argue with that. You can't nah. say. So. We were horrendous. Is. We were horrendous. Our culture was horrendous. Yeah. Whereas the, I think the Wigan culture actually was built on discipline, wasn't it? You know, it's hard work and discipline. Hard work and discipline, but at the same time, you know, we got people getting in trouble for all sorts. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, there was, there was, um, you know, we, no angels, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? w were you someone in that situation that if you saw that in others, you would, would, would step up and try and advise, or were you sort of very much looking after yourself? Back then? That period? Yeah. No, nah, not at all. You'd just be, let them get on with it. Yeah. I just thought each to their own, if that works for you, that works mm. for you. Yeah. I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do. You do what you do, and but like you said, you did have so much success um, at Wigan during that time. And actually, would you have stayed a bit longer if it wasn't for the personal reasons that you had to go back to New Zealand? Um, for? Yeah, definitely. Um, I was, I think, I was contracted for another year or another two years. I think it was, and I definitely wanted to because the way 2017 had finished, you know, we didn't even make the finals. Uh, lost the lost at Wembley. Um, I wanted to to go out better than that yeah mm. but it's taken out of your hands are you okay to talk a little bit about what what happened after that or uh i know you have in the past but you don't you don't yeah, have to oh, at all yeah maybe maybe at a later date yeah you know yeah but it was a it was a kind of strange turn of events in that you thought you'd be in wigan and then you go home and you have a year then mm. back back home what was that like how did it compare with the success you had at wigan and the year you had back in New Zealand in terms of rugby and the culture that we're talking about. Um, it was weird how it all happens. I've always had this nagging, this nagging thing that I, I want to play for the New Zealand Warriors. Yeah. So that's ever since I was, you know, picked up a rugby ball at eight years old. That was always my goal. Yeah. Um, I think it was one day we were at a uh, my secondary school went to like a uh, like a work expo day at Mount Smart Stadium where the Warriors play, and so you go inside and they tell you, oh, you have a look around at all these different. Uh, electrical apprenticeships and you know sign up for the air force and this and that and all the things you can do after school and I was walking around and like just nothing appealed to me at all and I went and sat outside as they were putting up the post I was just looking at the field I thought fuck like I don't want to do anything else but this like like whatever it's going to take I'm going to do that um, you know and play for the Warriors not just play you know for anyone I wanted to play for the Warriors and I Got a bit panicky during my time at Wigan where I felt like I was going to finish at Wigan. I was going to be here till for too long. And then... Cause, Starting an opportunity. Yeah, right? well, because the NRL, like, it, it is a really tough comp. And, I, you know, I couldn't just show up when I'm 31 and be like, all right, come on then, let's <laughs> let's have you. So I had a conversation with Wayne, I think, the year before. And I just said how I felt about um, maybe getting a release or options about playing for the Warriors. But... Uh, he, he wasn't too keen, but I don't think he 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 knew like how how strongly I felt about it. So I had this picture, and the picture is uh, the tunnel at Mount Smart. It's like uh, it's quite it's quite fancy. It's all painted up. They've been walking out the same tunnel since '95. It's quite famous, and I've got a picture of the tunnel looking out on the field as if I'm walking out. And so I've always had that uh, in my house by my bathroom or in my office or something. And that's always kind of stayed with me. And I knew it was going to happen, but I just didn't know when. So I think it was 2017, this guy, he was like a, he was one of my coaches when I was younger. He he quit coaching and he's he built daycare centers. And he's now a multimillionaire. And he rings me and says, Ant, you're never going to believe it. I've just bought the Warriors. I was like, no way. <laughs> he goes, mate, I've just bought the Warriors. How would you like to come I've come, and, come home away. and play? And I was just thinking, I knew this would happen. I knew it was going to happen. Like, I was so sure. Um, I called my mum and I said, mum, listen, um, so-and-so's just rang me. He's just bought the Warriors. <laughs> like, like, I knew it. I had the feeling it's going to happen. And she was like, oh, wow, that's awesome, son. Like, so happy, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, because coming back to what you said at the beginning about your family and bringing them together to see you then yeah. play out there must have been the yeah. most special of feelings. Well, that was it. And then as a, I've kind of followed it through the news. Um, you know, I checked the online news to see if he was telling the truth. And, you know, there it was, <laughs> his name. And then as I'm watching the news next week, oh, the deal's gone south. Oh, it's it's off the table. It's back and forth. Oh they don't want to sell it because this and that. And I was thought, oh, man, like, it was, it was too good to be true, you yeah. know. It was too good to be true. But... Um, 
yeah, so it, it didn't work out that year. The whole thing fell through, but I still had a feeling that it was going to happen. Yeah. I just didn't know how, but it was going to happen. And then, um, you know, obviously m my wife, um, she, had that, she had the crash, and straight away I knew I had to move back home. Um, it was kind of like stepping into the abyss because yeah. I was leaving. Well, when I first left Wigan, the intention was to come back. Um, when I got to New Zealand and I saw how bad, how bad a way she was, like I couldn't just, you know, leave her and rely, on, you know, all the best. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I stayed. Uh, I didn't have any contracts or anything lined up. Um, Were you out of contact at Wigan at the time? No, no. So I was still on for another two years, I think, or another yeah. year. So I think it was just before pre-season. Yeah, it was the day before, wasn't it? Something on the eve yeah. of the I, I went for starting. I came back for pre-season 2018 yeah. for a month. Yeah. And then after that month, just before end of That's November, right, yeah. she had the crash. So I went back. Um, yeah, it was just, I was looking at Rugby Union up where she lived because she, she was staying about three hours north. Um, I asked the Warriors, I said, look, like, like, what can we do? Is there anything I can do? And they said, nah, like our roster's full. Like, they just, they just not got anything for you. And, and you obviously wanted to be in New Zealand, not Australia, because yeah. you wanted to be close to yeah, her. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I was gutted. So I went back to them. Oh, twice I went to them, they said no. Um, I asked again. No way, really? I asked again a different way. They said, look, we can't do it. Like, there's no way. I was like, all right. Um, the third time I just said, look, I'll come for free. Just let me bring my boots, have a trial. They went, all right, sweet. <gasps> Are you um, serious? Yeah, yeah. And then I think they said you can have like a week's trial. Uh, train Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I think Saturday I signed in the top 30. So Jeez, that, that, well that week. But that, that's a oh, tough, yeah, you were killing it. Mate. That's yeah. a tough environment yeah. to think the pressure of that. Yeah. I just can't even get my head around the pressure that mm. that you must have been under at that time. What that's a side they had, by the way, huge. at that yeah. time too. So yeah, yeah, like Mark says, you must have trained <laughs> bloody hard that Wednesday, oh, Thursday, I did, Friday. Mate. I just thought if this is you know this is as close as I get, even if they say look thanks anyway, I just wanted to know that that week I gave it everything. Oh, and how were you yeah. feeling leading up to that week? Like, like John said, the pressure there must have been pretty unbelievable. Uh, I felt I felt confident. Um, yeah, it was it was hard. It was it was different different environment. Like when I was at Wigan, I was kind of the big guy in the back line, you know, kind of tall. You know, I stand out a bit. I got to the Warriors, and everyone is you know David Fusatua, Kim Amalo, like they're all massive and fast and can jump mm. and are fit and can go all day. And I just thought, fire, like, I'm going to have to... They can't jump off a cliff. <laughs> Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. They might Brett, be big and, and they can neck. catch, mate, but they, can they jump off yeah. a cliff backwards? You know, no, that's... No. <laughs> yeah, can yeah. they jump off Duke 92 after yeah. three Bs? No, they can't. Do you think that's the biggest difference between the NRL and Super League? The amount of bigger bigger athletes there are, or yeah. bigger, faster? Yeah, yeah. I think because they got the first pick of the bunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. That and the, you got, like, the island factor. Yeah, yeah, you know that's a that's a big yeah that's a big factor. Yeah, lots of different. You guys are bigger than us, and faster and stronger. Uh, yeah, fitter. Yeah. Traditionally, fitter. No. Yeah, maybe not. Yeah, traditionally, traditionally fair. Outside all the time. Yeah, yeah more power athletes, I'd say. Yeah, but if 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 you're a white kid growing up in Auckland, and you're still playing rugby league in your twenties, you're you're gonna be a professional. Yeah. Because to make it through those junior grades, when you know. I was playing against a guy, his name, what was his name? Alvin Mataveo, Samoan yeah. boy. He was about six foot four when we were 11. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's got like a little little goatee and that. And he yeah, was driving drive to the game. Driving to the game. Driving to the game. Yeah. Drive the game. <laughs> yeah. He was one of those guys, but the whole comp was full of them. Yeah. And so. So to survive that. To survive that, to come out that. So you don't see many white boys playing in, in nah. Auckland. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's I, would, I wouldn't have survived, I don't think. That's that's, that's been steam I think rolling. I think you had the skills, or me. I, I tackled I, I tackled Polly Polly at the weekend, yeah. and it was like literally well, I you, couldn't even get my arm around tackle? my eye. I thought he ran over. No, he did ran that over count me. as a tackle yeah. on the statue? No, it didn't. No, but literally, I was looking at his shorts when he came out to the game, and I was like, they're bigger than my. my I stand next to him with my skinny little legs, and it's embarrassing. Yeah, I thought I had skinny legs until I met Flash. Mm, they were yeah. unreal for a professional athlete, aren't they? <laughs> They work though, don't they? Yeah, they're doing their yeah, job still, aren't they? You yeah. say that. Um, I, I just, I just think it's such a remarkable story how all that worked out, especially for your family and your wife, so you could be with her in New Zealand, and all those great moments. And next thing you know, you're back, you're back in witness. 
Yeah. That, oh, I mean, that must have been, <laughs> we talk about changing culture and a bit of a shock to it as well, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, wh- what, how did that happen? And, and, you know, playing at the very top level with Wigan and then going to the Warriors to come back to Witness and then not playing at the top level mm. anymore. What, what was that like? Oh, there was, it was never the plan because when, when I signed with Witness, uh, I think it was June, they went on a 20-game losing streak. It so, was you. So it was your fault. <laughs> the curse. <laughs> the curse. <laughs> the that, not curse. the man of the people, it's just no, the curse. Yeah. Just the curse, <laughs> but, um, but, yeah. so, yeah, but, and also, but you talk about it, is, um, and actually you mentioned at the top of the podcast about what a st- it was a bit, a bit strange, not professional. It's yeah. the dark side, I think. You call it the dark side of rugby league? I call it the arsehole of rugby league. Let's go Excellent. with that. The dark side as well, whatever you want to call it. The arsehole is miles better. No, I'm not, I'm not uh, just can to make it clear, I'm not talking arsehole? about Witness or Witness. No, no, it sounds town. a lot no, no, no. like, are I mean, you talking specifically about Witness the town? No, no. <laughs> no? <laughs> I'm talking about Easy. the financial the situation the there. <laughs> Let's talk about your arsehole. I mean, let's talk about let's talk about the arsehole. arsehole. Um, what did you mean by the arsehole? It's tight. So I mean dot, like dot, dot. I mean like the ugly side. So it's not yeah. it's not your Sky Sports prime time. You know, seven no. thirty. It's under the lights. It's it's Barrow on a Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. And it's windy and the field's flooded. Yeah. You know that. Yeah, but you seem pain. to embrace that. Like seeing your social media and uh, on, on Twitter especially. You seem to embrace that and shed it in a good light by doing videos and kind of getting a bit of support around it. Yeah. Is that what you kind of thought? It's, you can you can take it two ways. You can sulk about it and kind of reminisce about better days or you can make the most of it and get a bit of support and a bit of love and joy around it. Yeah, can we just take a moment to acknowledge that Mark Flanagan just asked a question? Contributed. Well, well done. done. Thank you. Please carry on. <laughs> um, what was the question? <laughs> no, I'm not repeating that. It was quite long. But, yeah. Like you, no, you, sh- you, sh- you shed no, good light on, on yeah. like a tough situation the question. from where you've been. Do you want to go a third time? <laughs> <laughs> Please don't. No, yeah, I know, I know what you mean. It was, um, I think it was just making the most, yeah, making the most of a of a bad situation. You did tweet about that, didn't you? You did, I think, at the time, sort of saying this is a reminder of what it's about, and you know, it's mm. rugby league at the, the purest, I suppose. But yeah, yeah, it must be challenging after everything you've been through. Yeah, no, I, I enjoyed it. It was different. It's mm. it's it's kind of it's a special atmosphere. I think I spoke about. Uh, I said the type of person that it takes to come and watch witness at Barrow away, mm. like to have that that's, person watching. That's a special person. That's a special Isn't person. It? Yeah, well, it, but that's one way of looking at it. Spe- special uh, um, or strange. Do yeah. you know that's the same? Yeah. That could well be the same thing. Do you thing. know, that's We're what, all a little that's strange. witness is actually what got me into rugby league in the first place, though, because um, my first language is Welsh, and we used to is have it? a Welsh language show on S4C called Scorio. Mm. They used to show Italian football, bizarrely, and rugby league. When of course. Jonathan Jiffy, Davies. Jonathan yeah. Davies. <laughs> yeah. And let's not forget John Devereux. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. On the right wing, um, started playing rugby league, and then, and then sort of Scotty Gibbs went, and then Scott Quinnell, and that's with Wigan and St Helens, I properly got into it. But yeah. they played some decent rugby back in the day. Witness, Witness were the World Club champions yeah. at one point. Yeah. In the eighties, it was 80s. unbelievable. Yeah. But it shows you actually rugby league for all its history and heritage and stuff. Those big clubs, it's not nothing certain. No, no. Do you know, well, you described example, it as the arsehole of the game, and, mm. and if I can just think what you're trying to say is that. Not everything is as glamorous as it seems in professional sport, is it? Like no. the assumption that you're going to get paid on time, the assumption that that facilities are good, yeah. the assumption that 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 you know nutrition and you know your medicals all great and your insurance is fine and you know you can park at a ground. There's car park spaces. Yeah. You know, like you, you must be fine at Toronto. You probably get in advance, don't you? <laughs> yeah, private um, healthcare. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, yeah. Sonny sure. does. Is that sure. How it works? Um, Sonny will be all right. Look, that that side of the game is rarely exposed because what it's like when you go if you're dating or something, you always present the best side of yourself, don't you? Yeah. You very rarely turn up and go. By the way, yeah. I fart loads. <laughs> um, I've got a small kench. You know, occasionally I'd be oh, like a prawn from the West hygiene. Down. My personal hygiene's not great. You know, especially on a weekend. Yeah. You know, you would never do it, would you? So rugby league clubs very rarely show the inner workings oh, exactly. of themselves. You're not going to show up to a date and say, "Oh, by the way, I'm skint." <laughs> Which is what happened when I got to witness. You know, two months in. Oh, by the way, there's no money. <laughs> you could have told me that on the first date. Why? Why you waited till date five? I'm already committed. I've fallen in love here. That's what it was. <laughs> um, 
Um, but you, so you had your were um, you're a witness, and then and then Warrington. So I've I read lots about this about whether you were offered to go back to Wigan. Would you have liked to? I'm sure actually there would have been a few offers, wouldn't there, mm. bef before you signed? But was Warrington always the the first choice? Uh yeah, I liked I liked Warrington. Uh, what appealed to me is that um, I I didn't have to move my daughter out of school for uh. the, the fourth time in a year. Yeah, yeah. Um, also. They train at a university campus and there are links there, you know, for studying and stuff like that. So 29 years old, I'm also thinking about the transition after rugby. Wow. You know, on top of that, you know, they got a great squad. They got, you know, awesome coaches and, you know, some of my old mates, Josh Charnley, Jack Hughes. Yeah. So I just, yeah. It was a bit it's interesting you talk about being a little bit of a maverick, quite eccentric mm. uh, in terms of just seeing how things go. It's interesting, I don't know whether that's a father thing, that you're now thinking about the future because you have to a little bit, mm. is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think I think everyone has to, you know. It's mm. not like you can, especially rugby league, can't play forever, man. No. But uh, that's but a, the funny thing about that is, right, I reckon when you start your career, much like we were saying about you going through a dressing room and you're completely unaware of the implications of culture and all of these things, mm. I'd say the start and the middle part of your career, you should... You should just enjoy your career. I think there's always this pressure, like that you should constantly be like planning for the future. Yeah. But I think back to when I was like, you know, my early twenties, and like th the thought of not just relishing that opportunity, not giving it everything you've got, or not just really enjoying that because you feel guilty that you maybe should plan for something after. It's kind of a weird concept. Yeah. Do you know, you you, you know, I, but it's I, such a such a physical sport. It isn't is, it? yeah, no. But it is. I always had that guilt yeah. that I shouldn't have carried. You know, I'm 21, going, oh, but if it doesn't work out, yeah, yeah, why just relax? But that's what really? a self, right? Yeah. That that's a self limiting belief, right? You believe at any one time it's that your career is going to finish. Yeah. yeah, right. I'm not going to back myself. Why? Right? Because and I, you know, this could finish at any time, and I need to do something else. Mm. And we always talk about sports people protecting themselves for their career after rugby. Well, that's an individual responsibility. If you want to do it, mm. fine. If you don't want to do it, that's your choice too. Yeah. And th there shouldn't be like this safety blanket of of protection for guys. Like guys can make their own minds at, at what stage they want to Yeah, they need retrain. to be aware of the pros and cons and. But what? what but some lads that aren't aware of like that their career. But how patronising, Mark? You well, think no, that people not aren't aware of this responsibility? Well, yeah, I've played with lads that probably don't realise that. Yeah, mm. I have. Yeah. But so they just enjoy the career. But what I'm saying is, the self-limiting belief is I must plan just in case my career doesn't work. Yeah. And I think of like the top level, like elite people in the world. But they have I, to plan I just, regardless. I just don't think they think They have like to plan that, regardless because no. they have to retire one day. You can't play until you're 70. Yeah, those top, those top players don't, but for every one of those pension. top players, there's probably quite a few that, that, that do get that sort of yeah, but like, career like, threatening I'm, injury. I'm, or you just said you, felt gu you feel guilty for not having anything in place. Yeah, and that's like I think that's really common. Actually. Yeah, it's always it's always kind of that nag. Yeah, it's like that's anxiety. We yeah. build anxiety. We all have anxiety around different things. Yeah, I know, but we build like it. Like you probably have anxiety about like two pints of Guinness you had before, but you did it anyway. That's fine. Um, we build anxiety. <laughs> we do, don't we? I thought we build anxiety reason. into young rugby league players who are being paid the square root of fuck all money to do what they do. And why would you worry a guy who's getting paid 18 grand a year to be a professional sportsman about what he does next? Because mm. he can come and work in our coffee shop for 18 grand a year, Flash. No, he can't. That's it. Do you, know, do you know what I'm saying? What are we retraining these guys to do to, to earn like big money elsewhere? Mm. Well, they don't, they're not good. Like, if you don't need to retrain to so be a lawyer to, to earn the money that you, you earn as a rugby league player. You're not thought realistically. About, you're not thought about a coffee shop. Um, I have, actually. In town, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Warrington. and Warrington, I think Warrington would be an awesome spot for one. Would you think about a franchise situation with the boys, or uh? would you go on your own? Uh? Like a <laughs> uh? PKB? You know? no. hey, I'm, I'm, I'm open to anything, man. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. He's planning, He's yeah. planning for the future. I'm planning, yeah. <laughs> Probably do it a bit better. I'm, 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 yeah, I'm down for whatever. Hey, happy days at Warrington at the moment, though. I'd, I'd imagine if you nil St Helens, you probably get... What happens after the game? Do you see you, boys. Come back Monday. Don't worry about it. Have a few beers. Um, what do we do now? We train the next day. Had recovery. Um, go through the video and stuff. That was the Friday. So Saturday, Saturday, Sunday. Off. Yeah. Can we talk yeah. about Steve Price's really small punch that he does when he's celebrating the trip? Yeah, he does do that. <laughs> I've like, just noticed. No, no, it, yeah. it's not even a full punch. He doesn't he follow does through. Do that, actually, it's not yeah. a big punch. It's like a. He just yeah. does a little threaten. And dish. if you watch the game back, Lee Briz is copying him. Mm. Lee Briz started doing the small punch. Who hit it first? 
I think it was Steve Price. Steve Price had the very small punch, and now Lee Briers has developed an even smaller punch. Oh, I do it as well, coach. Yeah. Look at me. Yeah. Um, it's like people crossing the legs because the person next to them is doing it. Yeah, mm. I, don't, I didn't know what to do, actually. Do I've stayed true to myself <laughs> throughout the whole part. You're, you're just too big, aren't you, to yeah, we are. cross your legs? Yeah, we are. I'm trying not to get my socks on the camera. This <laughs> that's yeah, that's yeah, good. So it's an outfit. Um, I thought you were fantastic on the telly, by the way, during that game. Oh, thank you. I thought you, uh, you got a word in, which was nice. Mm. That's mm. always good. He always does. Um, the uh, but Liam Breeze, by the way, he must be the most annoying. Could you remember, like, I used to watch him live and he'd be in the back line. I mean, that's another thing. How long are you allowed to be in that back line bringing water on during the game? Do you remember we used to do that? Or what the trainer? Mean, yeah. yeah, bringing messages. It's on. crazy. I mean, yeah. what I does he say? Girl? You'd see him sometimes. I think, I think they had a crackdown on it a few years ago. They did, because with Wales, too long. when he was uh, coaching Wales, mm. he used to come on and you'd, you'd, you could see him. He was basically playing standoff, mm. but not touching the ball. <laughs> <laughs> That's physios now. Physios pass messages. Well, he'd done that when he was playing too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Welsh legend. I wonder if a word said against him. Uh, so he had a good week. And it's actually a positive start for, well, it wasn't. I tell you what was interesting was that, um, actually, two things. First game back against Wigan, um, it couldn't have been a better script for you in some ways, apart from the result, which we won't talk about. That must have been pretty weird running out of the DW against Wigan. Yeah, yeah. Is that, a, that was weird. Because there was a lot of hype about it beforehand. Yeah. Uh, what was it like in the end? Uh, it was a weird one because every time you, you try to imagine the game before you play the game, like I couldn't imagine what it would be like or what it was going to feel like. Because every, every time I imagined being at that stadium in those tunnels, um, it's, you know, playing for Wigan. And it's weird because I walked in and I see all the kit men and stuff and I used to always walk in and say hello. Yeah. And I thought, oh, no, I can't do it. Oh, well, of course <laughs> I can. <laughs> <laughs> Once I walked in. <laughs> all right, George, how are you, mate? <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was, it was nice to be back. And how of, was it playing nostalgia. against your, your old teammates? Because I watched the game and, and there appeared to be a period in the match when you tackled Joe Burgess in the in goal. Yeah. And then it looked like you like pulled some grass up off the turf and like sprinkled it in his face. It, it looked that way because it was that way. It was <laughs> <laughs> is that what happened? It's yeah, gone a yeah. bit viral, that, isn't it? Yeah, it's, um, yeah it's, it, was, it was fun to play against your mates. So, uh, that team, though, it's quite different. It's not, there's a lot of new new yeah, guys. Yeah. yeah. Just a bit on that, was that we. I think you were claiming that to be a Salt Bay moment, wasn't it? You know, yeah, the old shit. grass. Is that what you were doing with him? Was what was that all about with Joe? Is that something? How did because he, he didn't react? Did yeah, he? I think he was too tired, <laughs> too tired to react. Um, nah, Is that say. just part of your character coming out again? Oh, it's give him a bit of grief, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's all right, mate. Just, just let him, just let him know. I've just point. trapped him in goal. Yeah. Yeah. You must have done that when you moved, sort of moved on and playing. Got yeah, John and I played against each other when you were at Saints and I was at Salford. Mm -hmm. And we were both captains that day. And as we were walking out... Not a big deal. Not a big <laughs> deal. Legends, not, not, not a big deal. Surrounded mentioned, by legends. I mentioned it because he's really chuffed about it. No, but as we were walking out, you decided to hold my hand. <laughs> and like uh, with your strong grip. And we were both walking out to these 10,000 people and both captains were holding hands, which is <laughs> a bit weird. I kind of like that. Yeah, and he squeezed my balls in the game as well as he tackled me. Did you? Give him a little kiss. Why would you do that? Yeah, did he? Uh, it's probably some sort of weird psychological thing to try and assert my authority over him because mm. I'm feeling insecure as a man. Captain uh, to captain. Did that work? <laughs> I don't know. Is, yeah. it, is, there, is their mind game yeah. still well, strong they won in rugby right league? So. No. Yeah, there's a bit of that. There's a bit of mind games. But yeah, so it's just to get in his head. Yeah. And if you think it didn't work, it did because years later... Yeah. yeah, it's still, well, it has nightmares. No though. way. It's still bugging him, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is. He's brought it up. I didn't yeah. even know it was a thing. I forgot <laughs> I'd done it. Are you, are you guys good at that? Like, I was terrible at sort of any kind of sledge, and I didn't know what to say. I would just sound weak and stupid. Like, are you quite good at, do you get involved with a bit of chat? And have you got a couple of good one-liners? Uh, no? Nah, I, I, I keep to myself. Yeah. 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 Just salt. He dishes it out next to you. Do you? I don't. I don't. I used you to. You give well. refs a lot of shit, don't you? Um, yeah, he's a bit of a gobshite. Mm. I like. I like giving people shit after they've been hit really hard. <laughs> what, what <laughs> but it's never by me. I don't hit people <laughs> hard. <laughs> so <laughs> someone, one yeah. of the middles, will put the hit on, and I'll be running back. <laughs> Whoa! Yeah. 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 Just yeah, make noises. Yeah. Get that into ya. Welcome to the fortress. <laughs> um, I feel like if that's you how I feel like. Yeah. I that's can a be a part that's of that's your contribution be my contribution that's to good defence <laughs> fourth man in just with the words yeah uh, um, if you were a rugby player I, I get the feeling that well apart from the coffee shop um, and maybe a BMX shop who knows um, you'd definitely be involved in media in some ways after it'd yeah. be it'd be fool not to have a character like this um, mm. not them saying the career's ending soon um, 
but there but is a pressure just in case it does end. <laughs> no, have you got no. anything in place? No, <laughs> no, it's fine. He said he has. He's twenty nine. Yeah, he's yeah. been, um, you know, yeah, he's been professional about it. Um, but I know you've been doing a lot of stuff on social media recently. Mm. Was this your idea, the old um, the ankle bank? This ankle bank, yeah. Is this, is this you? Was this all you? Yeah, yeah. This was all me. So uh, it's kind of bringing some of my passions to life. Uh, sports, you know, sports, sports news, um, sports betting. And just talking Can you explain shit. a bit about what it is and for people who haven't seen it yet? Because um, it'd be good to get a shout out for yeah, it as well. So for a very, very good cause too. So what it? it is, what it is, it's a... It's it's sports betting, but it's non profit. So I've always I've always loved sports betting, um, and I didn't I didn't realize realize this till till you know quite recently is that a lot of people don't like sports betting. Um, talking to the guys at you know like Rugby AM, they're very strongly against sports betting. Um, Sonny Bill Williams very strongly against sports betting, um, and I looked into it. I said, well, well, why is everyone not into sports betting? And obviously. You hear about sports betting and straight away you think gambling, addictions, problems, blah, blah, blah. And I've had those problems and I've had those addictions and all that. But I thought if there's this thing that's so bad, um, people don't want to associate with it. How can I not only move past that but change it for something good? Yeah. So what it is is uh, every week we, we put a little bet on, you know, five bucks or whatever. Um, all the winnings go to charity. Because when I, when I looked into why people don't like it, so re religion-wise, um, they say doing the, like sports betting is, is just the pursuit of money. The pursuit of money is greed. Mm. You know, the pursuit of greed, it's not, it's not good. But I thought, well, if you take away the winning, you know, if you take, a, take the money figure out of it, like what you're winning, doesn't matter because it's going to someone else. So all of a sudden now it's about the fun of interacting with people, you know, who do you think is going to win? Let's have a conversation, you know, let's have a bit, um, I don't know, revelation. It could just be yeah. like when I was a kid playing and, you know, sports would bring people together. I like to bring people together this way. What kind of reaction have you had um, with regards to that? It's, it's been really good. So I, I spoke to my missus about doing something along these lines and when, when I thought of the name Ankle Bank, um, which is obviously, you know, the sock, the money in the sock. You That's know? how every social media yeah. post starts, isn't like it? I thought the of the money goes in the sock. And I just thought, wow, that's perfect. Like, yeah. it's what, is that a thing, keeping money in your sock? Uh, it is if it's a small amount of money. <laughs> it's a small amount. Yeah. 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 Which is, I think we used to do that a little bit. Do do yeah. It's also yeah. a thing when you ride your bike, because if you put it in your pocket, it's going to fall uh, out. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. That's just a bike. It's a bike thing. That's it. It's yeah. every, everything just. But, but actually, together. you talk about um, sport bringing people together, I think just rugby in general, because a lot of the funds are going towards Rob Burroughs, is that right? And mm. I think because of that Doddy Weir and Rugby Union, who mm. both suffering from the same awful condition. Mm. And uh, that, I mean, that, I know you've probably covered this. I know Rob is actually on the podcast in a couple of weeks, I think. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it is awful, but how wonderful for everyone to come together for him. That just proves how strong... The game of rugby yeah, league is, isn't rugby it? Is, rugby is a really small, when you actually look at it, it's a really small community, isn't it? Very, you know very you, small community. You're, like, you're very small, too small. Mm. You um, forget living in the Northwest, like we, like the media you watch and the stuff you listen to, you are in a bubble. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know what I mean? Everyone's in their own little bubbles all over the world. Like even in our bubble, it's a small bubble. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, it's, but that's what makes it that much more special. Yeah, and that's you know? cool. That's like part of its strength, isn't it? That then yeah. everybody supports everybody else you know and it's, mm. it's kind of it's a cool thing you know yeah it's one of the coolest things about our game um i remember doing some work back in 2013 world cup and they did try to sort of expand the reach of the game across the uk a little bit do you think mm. do you think that can happen here because this question i always ask you know is it always going to be northwest based i know we had sort of london involved as well mm. but you know in wales for example people just love rugby mm. yeah you know i get oh you're not allowed to like union and league, it's really weird. You get slated on social media if you say like one or the other. Yeah, I love rugby, but mm. whatever's got on the end of it, whether it's union or league. But you have to look back to the history, don't yeah, you? Yeah, of to course. Understand yeah. that. Yeah, but it's so all done in a hotel room, and they all decided to go a different way, didn't they? Back mm. in eighteen, yeah, whatever yeah. it was. But, but, that, but that history is never really. We've never really broken those shackles. Mm. Like when rugby union was using the school system, the you know the private school system and public school mm. system, whatever, to, to spread the game. Mm. Rugby league was dependent upon clubs amateur clubs and and you know factories and, and and certain little sects that were playing the game 
Yeah. So while rugby union's going around the world spreading its footprint, we we were not doing that. No. We we chose to like grow the game through independent sports clubs. Mm. So we'd set an up industry, a rugby club, yeah. an industry, and we'd play via that. And the the prolonged period of the amateur game in rugby union was an unbelievable leg up in terms of its global fo its global footprint. It was yeah. a jump, wasn't it? You know, and 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 for us to even this this is the weird thing. Like I don't think we should compete with that. Why would we be obsessed with with growing, like ob obsessed with it, when we can really secure what we've got now as a base, and mm. then allow teams to come in who bring capital and add something like my club Toronto, where they they've brought a serious investment, brought a cool city from a different side of the world into our competition. Mm. Then there's value, but in the meantime, can we not get the most out of what we're doing now? Yeah, if you look at is, Ireland, is it, the Gaelic Athletic yeah, Association yeah. is quite comparable in in loads of ways. It's a similar sort of geography. It's really focused in Ireland. It's regional. It's not got a growth. We don't play Gaelic. We don't. We don't play hurling. No, you know, in in the UK, but still, commercially, I think Etihad but, sponsor hurling to the tune of seven and a half million quid a year. Mm. You know, that's like the same challenge by them is embraced as a niche, like. We yeah. could be the sport of the north, and then we can build from there. I just mm. think we're sort of paranoid about it's being more than what we are. Yeah. Today. I don't know what it is with rugby league. I always feel like rugby league's like like the skint cousin or something. Yeah. You know? Mm. Or like the skint brother of rugby union. And it's always it always seems to be poor poor decisions somewhere, you know, marketing wise or or like you said, trying to reach into areas that we shouldn't reach or yeah. but but having said that, i think the organizers across the board know their fans probably yeah. better than most organizations when it comes to yeah, sport yeah. in terms of the stuff they put on but can i ask a question about the pinnacle like what's the pinnacle because you know um usually it's playing at international level mm. that's is that true of rugby league you know i know you with the nfl it's obviously within your your sit cities or states and then you know rugby union is probably international is the pinnacle mm. what about rugby league from a competition wise it's the the highest standard you could play but i think for in the uk especially for eyes on the game and publicity i'd say super league is is bigger because yeah. the international game probably hasn't grown as much as it's done it's probably stagnated well, whereas well, the yeah. game goes like this it goes state of origin nrl grand final and then it goes England versus Australia, England versus New Zealand, New, New Zealand versus Australia. Yeah. And then it goes Super League Grand Final. Yeah. And then it goes Challenge Cup Final. Mm. And then it goes, well... But in the UK, I don't, I don't think the same number of eyes are on in England internationals as there are Super League big games at the end of the season. It depends on where it's viewed, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, but it's, similar, it's similar, yeah. But the, the, the flip to that, the mentality of rugby league is always dominated by the clubs. The clubs run the game, as in the clubs, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, pay for the contractual obligations of the players. Uh, rugby union are centrally contracted, therefore it's much more lucrative to be an international rugby union player mm. than it is a rugby league player. Mm. I went to the World Cup for England Rugby League in 2008, and when I got back, and I'm not saying this, that I've, I, I love the game and I, I would have played it for nothing, but we got 380 quid for six weeks in Australia. Oh. Playing for England, after That's all smart. deductions. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. They double taxed us by accident. We got some back, but accident. yeah. And how was it playing for the Cook Islands? Yeah, it's not much better, mate. And in terms, like, because you guys are qualified. What for you the mean? World Cup. You mean money wise? Well, well, both. I mean, money wise. Qualified World Cup 2021. You're yeah. Wales's group. I mean. yeah, yeah, that's right, mate. And how was the game the growing on the back of? You know the Cook Islands involvement in these these kind of matches in the Pacific Islands. Uh, Cook Islands is a Cook Islands is a tough one because it's such a small place. Yeah. So the Cook Islands is ten thousand people. Is it? That's the whole country. Yeah. But they've got a lot of expats in New Zealand and. Yeah. So Australia, and New Zealand. I think there's a hundred thousand Cook Islanders. Right. Worldwide. I mean, but so the, the, team, the, the team you've got for the World Cup is a population of hundred and ten thousand. But the team, the team is made up. There's a couple oh, of yeah. Samoans who've come across, haven't they, and given their allegiance to the Cook Islands and stuff like that. Just just on that. No, no, no. They is half, they'll be half, half. So yeah. they're all like Don Perry's that, yeah, Cook yeah. Island, Samoan, yeah. Yeah. Um, but like, um, why did you decide to go down the Cook Island route? Was that just something you wanted to do? Cause th th your background or was New uh, Zealand yeah. ever an option? No, nah, I don't think New Zealand was ever an option. So when I was under 20s, um, I think I was 18, they said I was a Cook Islands team at the end of the year. 
um, they got a game against Samoa and Cairns or something. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'll go down and have a look. So they had a training in Sydney. Um, we went to training and they just said, um, yeah, be at the airport tomorrow at 9 a.m. I was like, seriously? Go, yeah, we're going to go for a week, play this game. Like the whole team was just kids from the under-20s comp with uh, I think like one or two kind of older boys. Um, we went to Cairns for a week, played Samoa who had like Francis Melly, um, you know, all the, I think Kylie Luluai just flew in, but they weren't playing that game because they were waiting to go to Papua New Guinea the next day for the Pacific Cup. Right. And so we played them and we beat them and we're like, yeah, how good's this? I think we won by like a drop goal. And then they said, oh, by the way, because you beat Samoa, now you take their place. This was actually a qualifier, not a warm up game. <laughs> so you take their place in Papua New Guinea in two weeks time. Wow. And I was like, what? Like some of the boys had to go back to work and we were struggling to find players and stuff. Um, went to Papua New Guinea, beat Fiji in the semi-final. Mm. Um, came up against PNG and if we beat them, we would have been in the Four Nations. <laughs> and we were winning at half time, you know. <laughs> so on the back of that, that 2009 team, we've had some real momentum. Um, I think everybody in that in that team got signed to an NRL club yeah. or Super League club yeah, that yeah. year. On paper, it looks like a really good side now, doesn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. it, it was awesome. Yeah. It was like Tanita Arona, um, Don Peru, uh, you know, some of the guys that are still playing Super League now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, back to Super League, just quickly. Warrington, this year, you mentioned you've got a good squad. Mm. Uh, it'll be tough. I was going to say it'll be tough against St. Helens, but actually, actually, um, after nilling them, it's not a bad start to the season. How do you see the Wolves going this year? Um, I think I think we got the best best chance. Um, it's it's hard, it's hard to predict these things, you know. Obviously, I'm, I'll say I back us to win. Um, I think I think the work that we've done in pre season is a lot different, or I get the feeling it's a lot different to what's gone on there in the past few years. So, especially our our one week in Portugal, um, you know, every night we had a meeting just about culture and how we want to do our culture, and it went it went quite deep. You know, there's a lot of honesty and uh, some really good good feedback and stuff. Um, I think it's just a really good vibe at the minute. Yeah. Uh, you don't play Salford for till April, I think, but you got mm. Toronto in a couple of weeks. And do you have any kind of fear or nerves when you know you you're coming up against the great John Wilkin? No. Um, if selected, I'll answer that for him. No. The answer is no, but he's probably politely going to say something like, "Well, yeah, he's yeah, all right. Yeah. Let's find Not out. as good as he the used to be, no. but he's quite good." If he played me, t if he played me like 15 years ago, when I was 21 and really didn't care about what I did after my career, <laughs> <laughs> you've been fine. <laughs> yeah. You always had the coffee. Now, nah, but just what what uh, Anthony can't say about Warrington this year is they're a great chance. Like they're as good a chance uh, as anyone. Um, I watched. I was at the game for for uh, Warrington and St Helens, and I was like really impressed with how Warrington moved the ball around. I thought. There's a really lazy way to win rugby matches and it's being just competitive and just, you know, just making sure you play the ball and kick it and then chase it and wait for someone to make an error. And I actually thought that's not what Warrington did at all. I thought yeah. when you could, you moved the ball, you stressed St. Helens' defence out. And I just think, like, that's pretty cool to come into a season and think, right, we're going to change something from last year. And it mm. might be the fact we just moved the ball a bit more than we did, yeah. play with a bit more ambition, and 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 I respect that. Someone who comes into a competition who already had a great squad, mm. have added to that squad and then go, you know what, we're gonna challenge everyone else to sort of maybe think differently. And mm. that's I know it's, we're two weeks into the year. God no, like we've got a place to do it. Well. A, a lot of that's um like Lee Breers, you know, he, he wanted yeah. to push playing different, you know, test like you said, testing people out, but at the same time never going away from the tough stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah you know, yeah. that's important because a lot of teams are kind of do one or the other. Yeah, true. But you know, you, you could you can play different and move the ball around, but yeah, there's some things that aren't negotiable. Don't get rid of the salt bay, and, uh. and maybe when you're scoring tries this year, have a little slide in for us, will you? Out of respect to the podcast. 1980s. <laughs> 1980s. style, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anthony Gallian, thank you so much for being our guest. Hey, thank you for having me, mate. Thank you. Cheers.